Welcome to CEF Insights, your source for closed-end fund information and education, brought to you by the Closed-End Fund Association. Today we are joined by Chris Eads, Portfolio Manager with ClearBridge Investments. Chris will discuss the energy market and the potential for MLP strategies to provide solutions in a challenging market environment for income-oriented investors. Chris co-manages three closed-end funds, ClearBridge MLP and Midstream Fund, ticker CEM, ClearBridge Energy Midstream Opportunity Fund, ticker EMO, and ClearBridge MLP and Midstream Total Return Fund, ticker CTR. Chris, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Chris, I want to start by looking at the market environment. The Federal Reserve has raised interest rates in five consecutive meetings. Inflation has been running high and economic growth has slowed. We also have significant geopolitical tensions that have added to volatility. You and your team focus on the energy sector. Where do you see the energy markets currently, and what is your outlook for the rest of 2022 and into 2023? Well, I mean, the outlook for energy, I think, is constructive, given some of the issues that you mentioned, the geopolitical issues that are certainly um, pervasive uh, in Eastern Europe right now with Russia and Ukraine, and Russia being a large supplier of oil into the market. But if you take a step back from uh, just the day-to-day volatility in the commodity markets, crude oil specifically, the physical market is actually quite tight. The United States has been putting oil into the market by uh, releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the SPR, and they've been adding about a million barrels a day of supply into the market. Despite that large amount of incremental supply that's coming into the market from our Strategic Petroleum Reserve, inventories have been trending, you know, maybe slightly up, but really kind of sideways over the last three to six months. And if we had not had that oil being put into the market, I would argue that uh, oil prices might even be approaching all-time highs right now. So certainly that extra oil has alleviated some of the tightness in the market. But keep in mind that SPR releases of oil will end sometime here in late 2022. And ultimately, the oil that was pulled out of the SPR will have to be put back in. So what has been a source of supply in the market today, very likely, uh, not very likely, it will become a source of demand for oil to refill those reserves at some point uh, in 2023 and most likely uh, in in 2024. You look at the production side and, you know, it's hard to find where production is going to be growing. Russia is obviously constrained given the issues uh, with Ukraine. OPEC broadly is close to producing their maximum amounts. And in fact, they've been underproducing their quota now for the last nine months. A lot was made uh, last week about OPEC uh, deciding to uh, reduce their quotas by 2 million barrels a day. However, they've been underproducing their quota by 3 million barrels a day. So it really wasn't a, a big physical announcement in the marketplace. It was more optics on trying to get their quotas more in line with where, where their actual production levels are. So as I look into 2023, I mean, oil today is sitting in the, in the high 80s. I certainly see uh, the possibility that that drifts higher, and it could move meaningfully higher once the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve releases uh, end. The big question mark is obviously uh, the economy and what what that's going to do to overall demand for oil. But keep in mind, even in uh, you know recessionary environments, you know oil uh, demand does not uh, contract drastically. I mean, outside of COVID, if you look at the worst recessions that the U.S. as well as the world has gone through over time. And you typically see a 0.5 to 1.0% decline in demand in really, really ugly economic environments. That's not enough to completely tip the tide to where oil goes from being structurally tight to where there's a a massive surplus of oil in the marketplace. So, I mean, we'll have to see how the the economic environment lays out as we move uh, through these interest rate hikes. And and those uh, have what will certainly be uh, lasting impacts on the U.S. economy and the global economy, for that matter. All that being said, I I think uh, the environment for crude oil looks quite good as we move into 2023. Let me briefly touch on natural gas, and and then I'll pause and we'll do more questions. Natural gas is also structurally uh, tight. Inventory levels today are well below the levels that they were at a year ago. Demand continues to move higher, and supply uh, is struggling to keep up with that. That's only going to be accentuated, that dynamic of growing demand and tight supply, when these incremental liquefied natural gas or LNG facilities that are currently uh, in various phases of government permitting and construction come online. So clearly, Europe would love to uh, use less Russian natural gas and use more U.S. natural gas via LNG. That's not going to happen overnight. I mean, building these facilities and permitting these facilities takes three to five years. 
But that is going to be a significant tailwind for natural gas demand as we move out over the next three to five years. And as a result of that, I'm structurally positive on natural gas as well. I have heard you discuss the changes in the business model of master limited partnerships. Can you discuss how you see the shift in this business model and where MLPs are today? Of course. So, I mean, heading into the pandemic, MLPs or midstream companies, as I'll loosely call them, uh, and, and remember, these are companies that transport, store, and process energy commodities. These are not the production companies. These are the uh, infrastructure companies behind the energy sector in the United States. Heading into the pandemic, these companies basically paid out all of their cash flows to investors in the form of uh, distributions or dividends. And to the extent there was any shock to their cash flow streams, which certainly the pandemic presented, they were left not being able to fully earn the distributions and dividends that they were paying out to investors. That resulted in a widespread uh, reduction in income or dividends and distributions from the MLP companies. However, on the other side of the pandemic, as we sit today, MLP companies are now earning their dividends or distributions by a factor of two. Said differently, their cash flows are two times the amount of the dividends or distributions that they're paying out to us. And the most important change in the business model, beyond the fact that they have higher coverage of their dividends and distributions, is the fact that they now are generating free cash flow. This has been a, a sector that historically has needed to access the capital markets, both the equity markets and the debt capital markets, to finance any growth activities, whether that was building a new uh, infrastructure asset or acquiring an existing asset. However, today, the companies are sitting with uh, free cash flow after they pay their dividends, after they fund their capital programs, such that with this surplus cash flow, they've been able to reduce their debt levels, they've been able to start buying back stock, and they've begun to slowly increase their distributions or dividends that they pay to us. How do these changes affect the ability for MLPs to provide attractive, sustainable income streams for investors? Well, I mean, this is just simply a much better business model than what they had going into the pandemic. I mean, we're coming out of the pandemic with dividends and distributions, as, as I said before, which are two times their operating cash flows. That's a much more sustainable income stream to investors and MLPs and, and certainly investors in the three uh, closed-end funds that I manage in the MLP space. Even if we have a period of reduced cash flows, and let's call it like it is, this is a cyclical sector, the energy sector broadly, these companies can withstand downdrafts to cash flows that they previously would have been forced to cut or, or reduce their distributions or dividends to us. Very unlikely that's going to happen if and when we have a, a year where operating cash flows don't quite meet expectations. Chris, we mentioned three closed-end funds you co-manage, CEM, EMO, and CTR, which focus on investment in master limited partnerships. What is your process to evaluate potential investments, and how do you then make specific security selections and allocate those positions as you build your portfolio? Well, first and foremost, it really comes down to geography. And by that, I mean, we need exposure in our funds, the three funds that you mentioned, to those areas, those basins that are going to have a production growth over the next three, five, or even 10 years. So that's the first cut, is trying to understand which companies have infrastructure assets in those regions where production is likely to grow looking forward. So if you look at crude oil, that's by and large going to be in the Permian Basin uh, out in West Texas, to a lesser extent, the Eagleford Basin in uh, South Central Texas, and the Bakken oil field, uh, oil basin rather, uh, in North Dakota. If you look at natural gas, there's really two major regions that are going to contribute to the growth in natural gas production over the coming years. The first would be the Marcellus, which effectively underlies the state of Pennsylvania. And then you have the Haynesville, which kind of straddles the Louisiana and Texas border in the south near the Gulf Coast. What are the key factors or events that would lead you to sell a particular portfolio security? Well, I mean, every security that we have in the portfolio, I mean, we have an investment thesis for that. And I've learned, and I've, I've been doing energy investing now in one form or another for over 30 years. The minute you start trying to justify owning a security for different reasons than you initially decided to put the security in the portfolio, I mean, 99 times out of 100, that's a red flag that should lead you to sell that security. So we have an investment thesis. They don't always work. Let's be honest about that. But when the, the thesis starts to falter or, or break down, that's the signal for us to exit that uh, particular security. Are valuations in the MLP space currently at attractive levels? 
I, I think they are. I mean, if you look at cash flow multiples where they sit today, and, and this sector has performed well. I mean, the sector's up over 15% here in 2022 in the face of what obviously is a, is a very bearish market for overall equities in the U.S. Despite that outperformance, cash flow multiples today actually sit below the levels that we had before the pandemic. And as I mentioned before, with a much better and much uh, more secure business model than we had uh, going into the pandemic, I would argue that cash flow valuations should ultimately at least return to the levels that we saw before the pandemic and certainly an argument could be made that we should see expansion of multiples beyond the levels we saw before the pandemic, given the improvements in the overall business model for MLP companies. Where do you see the best opportunities? Well, I mean, I think the best opportunities, are, I, I, mean, I mentioned before, uh, Basin specifically, but I think you need to, beyond focusing on the basins themselves, we need to understand where these hydrocarbons, where the barrels of oil and where the MCF of natural gas are going to be going. And I think uh, some of the better opportunities are going to be on the export markets. You know, 10 years ago, we were not exporting any oil into the global market. And today, that's a growing number. It currently sits around three or four million barrels a day. And that likely increases going forward as the world, uh, largely outside of the U.S., is capacity constrained on producing oil. And for natural gas, as I mentioned before, there is definitely going to be an incremental demand for natural gas in the coming years, certainly from Europe, but also from uh, Asia, specifically uh, China. What do you see as the key risks in the MLP space in the current environment? Well, it, it's kind of what I touched on before when, when we were talking about uh, crude oil. Demand for commodities is certainly economically sensitive. And if the global economy and the U.S. economy specifically are going to be much worse into 2023 than what the market expects today, that could present a downdraft for the sector. But as I mentioned before, irrespective of, of any economic risk, these companies are well insulated to continue generating the income stream to investors, given the fact that they're now over-earning their uh, distributions or dividends by a factor of two relative to operating cash flows. Chris, how would you see an energy strategy focused on MLPs being best positioned in an income-oriented investor's portfolio? Again, it's the security of the income stream. We've had a lot of pain and a lot of suffering that investors have gone through who own these securities into the 2015-2016 oil price collapse and certainly uh, how these stocks traded in March of 2020 when the pandemic began. However, we sit here today and you have a sector that's yielding roughly 7.5%. It's extremely well covered by operating cash flows, and it's very likely to grow going forward. It's not going to grow double digits the way we saw uh, you know, in the 2010 to 2015 time horizon, but it is very reasonable to think that you're going to have roughly 5% growth in that income stream you know, over time. So you're looking at a sector that yields 7.5% with 5% growth and another 2 to 3% uh, free cash flow yield above and beyond di distributions and capital expenditures. I think this sets the sector up for sustainable low double-digit uh, returns over time. That's not a guarantee, obviously, but certainly from a valuation perspective and given the visibility of the cash flows and the sustainability of those cash flows, uh, irrespective of what economic environment we're in, I think the sector is very well positioned. It may and very likely could be volatile going forward, but I would encourage investors to uh, weather that sort of volatility, understanding that the income stream that they're receiving is readily secure relative to operating cash flows. Chris, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And we want to thank you for tuning in to another CEF Insights podcast. For more educational content, please visit our website at www.cefa.com. This material is not and is not intended as investment advice, an indication of trading intent or holdings, or the prediction of investment performance. All fund-specific information is the latest publicly available information. All other information is current as of the date of this presentation. All opinions and forward-looking statements are subject to change at any time. ClearBridge Investments disclaims any responsibility to update such views and or information. This information is deemed to be from reliable sources. However, ClearBridge does not warrant its completeness or accuracy. This presentation is not intended to and does not constitute an offer or a solicitation to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, product, investment advice or service 
nor shall any security, product, investment advice, or service be offered or sold in any jurisdiction in which ClearBridge is not licensed to conduct business and or an offer, solicitation, purchase, or sale would be unavailable or unlawful.